Alrighty, so th this particular package is called a JL350 package. So we make a JL370 and a JL350. The ref the, those numbers reference the tire size. So a 350 is centered around a 35 inch tire, a 370 is centered around a 37 inch tire. That's the, that's the easiest way to remember it. There's more that goes into it, but just at a first glance or when you're talking to a customer, that's the biggest differentiation. Okay. I didn't know. Typic typically, you know, and that's it's fine. So embarrassing. All of all of our product names are named for a reason. Prospector XL. XL is Roman numeral for 40, so it's a reference to the tire size. Yeah, so that they're all oh, they're all like named that for a reason. <coughs> What's that? It's like a double here? entendre. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, JL350 package, okay? So the JL350 package typically comes with our spacer lift and a 35 inch tire. This one is done a little bit differently, so I'll point out the differences as we go. But when you're starting to describe it to somebody, starting in the front, the front bumper, same terminology. It's a, it's a stamp steel modular bumper, okay? Stamp steel applies to the shape of the bumper, how it's more curved. So typically, aftermarket bumpers are done via press brake, where the flat sheet of steel is folded over. Okay, and every time you fold the steel, that edge becomes the more vulnerable vulnerable or weaker spot of the bumper. So other companies have to compensate by using a really thick gauge of steel. The problem with that is you end up with a ton of extra weight on the vehicle. Um, so stamp steel, literally, you compress it over the shape you're trying to form, and it gives it a much more rounded look. In the process of stamping it, they first, the, the sheet of metal is hanging, um, and they heat it up, okay? It becomes red hot. It literally looks like a big saggy diaper. It's red hot. Right when they stamp it, they shoot it with water jets and it quenches the steel. So what happens when you do that is the metal molecules compress closer together and it hardens the steel. It actually comes out of the form a little bit smaller than it goes in. But what happens when you do that is if you look under a microscope, all the metal molecules are kind of dancing around and then when you shoot it with the water, they shrink together and it hardens the steel and makes it stronger. So it's, it's, long story short, it ends up being 10 times stronger, but lighter than your traditional press brake steel, okay? Um, it's really expensive to do. There's only five plants in the whole country that have the capability of doing that, um, which is why most other competitors don't do it. Um, modular means in sections. So there's a center section, and then there's these two outer wings, okay? These end caps, we have two different versions. This version is the stubby version, or what we call our rock series. It gives you a better approach angle because your tires will be the first thing to hit an obstacle when you're off-road. We also make, like if you look at the, the classic jail over there, that version of the bumper where the bumper ends go all the way out to the ends of the fender flares. That's our Expedition Series bumper, okay? Um, this is going to give you a little bit better performance off-road. If you're, if there's a giant boulder, if you can picture, and you need to get up, up and over that boulder, if there's nothing here in the way, your tire can crawl over it. In that case, you have a little bit less approach angle. If you notice, the ends of that bumper are still tapered upward, so you get as much approach angle as you can, but still not as good as this. The, the benefit to the full-length bumper, like on that one, is going to be impacts, obviously. That's going to give you a lot more front-end protection. But also, that version, that bumper, is a little bit quieter. If you're on the freeway, wind will come through here, and you can hear it in your wheel wells when you're driving down the freeway. Where that version, the wind goes up and over the flares, it's a little bit quieter. So this is going to be a lot better performance off-road. That's going to be a little bit quieter and better protection for daily driving, if that makes sense. So Expedition Series, Rock Series, okay? Um, then right above, you have these pads here. These are literally knee pads. So if you have to change your spark plug, hook up something to your air compressor, freaking just wash the center of your hood, you're, changing, you're plugging something up to your battery, this gives you somewhere to kneel from rather than trying to stand on the tire and do one of these. So just little creature comforts, <laughs> kind of funny. Then right, right above the bumper is our bull bar. It's actually hollow. So all the wiring from the lights is tucked in here so you don't have lights, lights hanging down. So. It, it's bolted down into the bumper here to protect the radiator. Then we intentionally hang the lights. So if you look at a lot of competitor bumpers, the lights are mounted down here. The reason we hang them up here is so that you have all this free space in here to access your winch line. So, and if you notice, we also give you like two and a half inches of room here to get your hands in there. If you look at any other bumper, the Mopar bumper, you name it, you can't even get your finger in there. The reason that this is so important we move all this stuff just to give you this space. The reason that's so important is if you hook somebody up and pull them out and then you need to spool your winch back in, but your winch line gets all twisted up or you get rocks or sticks or mud stuck in there, 
you need to be able to get in there and free them out or untwist your line. Otherwise, you got like 50 feet of cable, and you're like, what do you do? What normally people what they do if that happens is they wrap their bu their cable around the corner of their bumper, then they get home and they have to take the whole damn thing apart just to spool the winch line back in. So just this little piece of mine here is 100% designed just for you to be able to free that up. It's a little, little thing in that, right? So the lights themselves, uh, so the lights are kind of funny. So in the past, we used ARB's IPF lights, okay? Um, when the JL, the, the new Wrangler came out, we wanted to des design our own lights. So what we did is we bought a whole bunch of, the, of our competitors' lights and said, okay, it's got to be same price point, but a better light. So we went to Tyree. Tyree, T-Y-R-E, is a, a commercial mining equipment manufacturer for lights. So they make lights for like caterpillars, huge, dusty, dirty places, way overkill for what you would need for off-roading, and said, okay, we need, we need it to be the best waterproofing you can get. So they're IP69 waterproofing. It's a 6,000 Kelvin, which is the color. So it's pure white light. It's not like off yellow. It's not like a blue where you're going to get in trouble. Just pure white light. It's a combination spot and floodlight. So what that means is you get a really wide pattern, but it's also really far. So it's kind of like, like a Christmas tree, if you can picture it. It's really wide, a big triangle. So what that does is it gives you wide visibility, but you can also see really far. Um, then if you look, there's these blue bushings where the lights mount. See these guys? Those are for vibrations. So if your Jeep is on a dirt road, right, and it's, and it's doing this, you don't want your light pattern to be doing this off on the distance. So these absorb the impacts so while your Jeep is rattling, your, your light beam is still true. Does that make sense? It's pure, it's not rattling off in the distance. Kind of cool. Um, it's just about 5,900 lumens, which, which means it's super bright. I mean, the factory LED lights are like 1,800, so more than three times just about the brightness of the factory lights. So super, super bright. They're wired into the auxiliary one position, so there's no extra buttons you need to learn how to use, it's just aux one. They come with dust covers, just for compliance. Um, the dust covers, have little tabs so it lines up with our logo so they kind of self-centering if that makes sense mm -hmm. all right in the winch so on the wranglers we use the warn 10s winch okay warn is the manufacturer 10s is a reference to this specific winch so 10 is the weight capacity 10,000 pounds s is for synthetic which is the type of cable so the cable synthetic is like a braided fabric if you will just to make it easy your options for a winch line are synthetic or steel okay a steel cable line is the old way of doing it it's been around since before any of us were born um, it has its disadvantages it's a lot heavier so it's more weight on your bumper the weight also means it draws more power to for you to spool it back in um, it's braided steel so it's susceptible to the sun weather corrosion it starts to fray and it can slice up your hands you have to wear gloves but the the biggest takeaway on it is a steel cable winch is not as safe. Steel cable, when it's under load, it stores kinetic energy. It stores all that load. So if I'm hooked up to a truck down the street and I'm pulling them out and that cable snaps, all of that load, that tension, whips back. You could, you could jump on YouTube, people get hurt. It's kind of crazy, but it's, it's not as safe. Synthetic doesn't have any of those drawbacks. Um, it's not as heavy, so it's not drawing as much power. It's not as much weight sitting on the front. But the safety factor is the big one, the one you want to focus on. So I could literally hook this guy up and pull him out from here and stand here. If that cable snaps, it'll just drop to the ground. You can you can usually tell what kind of winch a person has by where they stand and when they use it. If, if they're hiding behind the door or behind a tree, it's usually a steel cable. If they're just standing here, it's usually synthetic or they're, or they're an idiot, <laughs> right? So that's like literally the best winch you can get. It's a little pricey, but you, you pay for what you get. So. Uh, factory fog lights, um, recovery points. So these recovery points, they wrap around and then go back to the frame over here. So the reason that they mount to the frame is the weight rating on these is a little over two times the weight of the vehicle, each independent of each other. That, that's important because if you're stuck somewhere and this one's buried in the sand or behind a rock, you, you need to know you can safely still pull yourself out from one of these. You don't want to be like, well, I'm hope, crossing your fingers and hoping it doesn't snap off. These are rated at more than double the weight of the vehicle independent of each other so you could pull from either one of them safely if you're stuck somewhere you don't that's the last thing you want to worry about is this is this going to hold you know what i mean so um these little guys here cheese little teeny cutouts kind of random they're yeah. called windows and what they're for is if if you you know what a high lift jack is or a farm jack so yeah the chin or the the bottom piece of the farm jack 
will sit in there. And that way when you're lifting the vehicle up, it doesn't pop off on either side. So if you need to lift up the vehicle and move it over to get it out of the rocks or just move it, you don't want to start lifting and have it slide off and knock out your buddy or drop the Jeep when you don't want it to. So that just gives it a cradle or a spot to hold it. That makes sense. All right, and just below that is our skid plate. So the skid plate, uh, it wraps around on the sides, there's these big metal brackets here that drop down from the frame. They're called frame horns. So the skid plate has to take this really dramatic steep angle to cover the bottom side of that. What happens then is it creates a hollow spot that we tucked our light bar into. So you get a light bar tucked mm -hmm. into the skid plate. It's got these two teeth to protect it so you don't smash it on a rock. Uh, we call it a rock light. You can get it in amber like this one or white. Um, amber is literally designed to cut through particles in the air. So if it's snowing or dusty or dirty or you just got fog in the air, white tends to reflect where amber can kind of cut through that light and you can see better. So the amber is better for not the greatest of the air conditions, if that makes sense. The white is really nice just for canceling out shadows. If you're ever off-roading and the sun is behind you, a tiny little rock can cast a huge shadow, and you think, oh, I'm, you put your lockers on, you call your spotter to come watch, and it's a tiny little rock. Just having some light down low to, to cancel out shadows can make a difference on whether you get your spotter and you're safe or you don't and you're okay, if that makes sense. So light down low is kind of a big deal. All right, you wrap around the side. So this Wrangler is a 4XE, okay? That means that the weight distributed in this is completely different than any other Wrangler. Most Wranglers, all the weight's in the front. On a 4XE, it's distributed a lot more evenly throughout the vehicle, and it's a lot heavier. What that means is you can't use the same suspension that we use on a gas Wrangler on this. So the suspension on this Wrangler is specific to a 4XE. It, take, it took us probably a year and a half to develop just because it had to be perfect. You can't just put on a diesel suspension and hope it drives well. It wouldn't work out that way. So. The springs and shocks are tuned specific to a 4XE. Okay, we have a different tune for a Wrangler with a 392 or a 36 or a diesel or even the little turbo four cylinder. We have a different tune because the weight configurations and layouts are different. So when you're talking about the suspension, um, keep in mind this is a Sahara. So the Sahara has a lower fender flare than a Rubicon. So we only put a 35 inch tire. If this was a, a Rubicon 4XE with a raised fender flare, we would put a 37 because you have more room in the wheel well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So with this one being a 35 inch tire, uh, when you're talking about the suspension, we'll talk about the spring first, okay? The two terms you want to remember are frequency tuned and triple rate, okay? Triple rate means it's literally got three spring rates, okay? If you look at the top of the spring, the coils are so close together, they're basically touching, right? And then you go further down the spring and they get progressively spaced out. When the springs are really close together, like if you look at my fingers, that gives you a firmer or stiffer spring rate. The That's advantage nice. to a firm or stiff spring rate is for one, it can carry more weight. So if you sell this to somebody that's going to drive around with their whole family in a rooftop tent, the firmer, stiffer spring rate can handle the load. Okay. Uh, the other advantage that has is if you need to bounce off of something, if you have a harsh impact, that stiffer spring rate can handle the harsh impact, okay? So when you're off-roading, if you hit a rock a little too hard or you need to bounce up an obstacle, you can that stiffer spring rate can handle the impact. Then you go progressively down the spring and you have a softer spring rate. That's completely the opposite. So if you sell this to a customer that's single by themselves, that's going to drive around year-round with the doors and top off, that softer <coughs> spring rate can handle the lesser load and it's not going to drive really stiff. Okay. The other thing that that does is when you're off-roading, the soft spring rate allows the spring to flex so you get the travel to keep your tires on the ground, more articulation. If you're going over sand dunes or slow crawling, it still gives you the flex and the access. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the, the better on-road capability, the better, better weight carrying capacity, but also better off-road handling and a variance of weight carrying capacities. Does that make sense? So regardless of who your customer, your end customer is with this, it can handle kind of whatever they throw at it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was the triple rate. Now frequent, frequency tuning, um, the easiest way to explain that is we have to tune the springs, the front spring and the rear spring based on how far apart they are from each other. <clears throat> okay, so if you picture a two-door Jeep, right? That rear axle is like right here, four doors here, 
gladiators like clear back here. Okay, the springs have to know how far apart they are from each other. Otherwise, when you go over a set of bumps, the back end's just gonna do this for a while until it catches up to the spring rate right of the front. So if you've ever driven like an old leaf sprung truck over a set of railroad tracks and the back end just does this for a while, that's a good example of what happens if, if they're not tuned based on the distance from each other. Okay, so the springs front and rear are tuned specifically based on the wheelbase. So there's a different set of springs for a two-door than there is for a four-door than there is for a gladiator, regardless of if it's a 4XE, a 392, or 36. The engine configurations are different as well, but the wheelbase is a big factor. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the spring. <laughs> that's nuts. Yeah. I'm just going to say that's nuts. It is, and that's part of, part of the reason that that's so important is a lot of companies give you an off-the-shelf, like, here's your Wrangler suspension kit, have at it, and then everyone's like, why doesn't it, why does AEVs drive so much better? It's just a, a shock and a spring like everybody else does. It's like, no, it's not just the same. Like, we have, like, just like on the Ram, you have to be two different spring rates. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we have a different spring and shock configuration for a 3.6 two-door, and then a different one for a 3.6 four-door, and then a different one for a 3.6 gladiator. If that makes sense. So times that by every engine option, by every two-door, four-door gladiator, we make a lot of different suspension kits. And that's why they drive so well, is because they're specific to each application. Yeah. So when in a warranty scenario, for example, if your customer calls up and says, I need a shock, we're gonna say, What's your VIN number? Like it's it's that specific, or what exactly? Send us a copy of your window sticker so we know what we're building. So when you're talking about the shock, we make two different shock options. Okay. Um, we make a Bilstein 5100 series, and then this one has the upgrade, the Bilstein 8100 series. The 5100 series is a monotube shock um, without the reservoir. So, Bilstein is the manufacturer, but it's not like you just jump on Amazon and order up a Bilstein and think it's going to ride like an AEV. The tune in that shock is specific, to, same thing, to the engine and the wheelbase of each vehicle. So, if you take that shock out, you cut it open, inside there's a whole bunch of it looks like washers or like 50 cent pieces whatever um, and how many of those is in the body of the shock and how thick each one is changes how the fluid can pass through the shock and that's, that's essentially how you tune a shock so again the tune is specific to each platform okay so Bilstein actually has Bilstein actually has like a 60 foot motorhome if you will that they do shock tuning out of so when we got all of our JLs and Ram trucks, they were at our facility for about a half a year developing all the different tunes, just pulling vehicles in and pulling them out and tuning them and pulling them in and pulling them out until we got the, the configuration exactly how we wanted it. So this one has our 8100 series shock. So what that means is it's a larger diameter, but it also has this auxiliary hose that runs over here to this remote reservoir. So the remote reservoir carries extra shock fluid, okay? so. The, the reason you want extra shock fluid to make it as easy to understand as possible is shock fluid performs best when it's not hot, okay? It, it, the hotter it gets, the more viscous it gets, and it doesn't perform as well. So if you have extra fluid, it takes longer for that fluid to heat up. So think of it like like water on a on your on your stove. When you're boiling water, if you've got two ounces of water, it'll boil like that. If you've got a gallon of water, it takes a lot longer to boil. In this case, you don't want that water to boil so having extra fluid takes longer to heat it up so it'll maintain the performance of your shock for a longer period of time in real life applications what that means is if you're constantly cycling your shock the more fluid you have the longer it's going to perform at its best so if you're going down a dirt road and your shocks are doing this this application is going to perform better over a longer period of time it also helps with weight because your shocks are also cycling because the additional weight so just a better all-around option all right when you go to the tires, uh, again, because this is a Sahara, it's a 35 by 1250 by 17. Those numbers are on in inches. So 35 is 35 inches tall, so your diameter, bottom to top. 12 and a half, which is your width, so 12 and a half inches wide. 17 is your wheel height, so your wheel height itself. Uh, all of our wheels have the same dimensions because we only make them for the Wranglers, so there's kind of a sweet spot on the Wrangler to put that wheel. You don't want to stick the tire so far outboard that you're slinging mud all over the all over the place, you're compromising your turning radius, and you're putting strain on your ball joints. You don't want to position the tire inboard that you're just freaking rubbing on everything, so there's kind of a sweet spot. Um, then 17, we always use a 17-inch wheel because we want to give you the sidewall. Sidewall is the distance from the top of your wheel to the top of the tire. Sidewall, think of it like a pillow. The more 
sidewall you have, the more cushioning you have for, even if it's just potholes or cracks in the road, sidewall can absorb that. But most importantly is when you're off-roading, the, the basics there, step one of off-roading is to lower your tire pressure. Lowering your tire pressure expands your footprint on the ground and improves your traction. So if you've got a 17 inch wheel, you can air down quite a bit before you need to worry about smashing up your rim. If you have a, a, a 20 inch wheel, you can only air down so far before you're riding on your rim. So the sidewall is going to help with that. All of our wheels are cast aluminum to save weight. Uh, this particular style is called a Salta. We make them in a beadlock option. Like that, right here. That, that was actually our protection ring, but same look on a beadlock. All right. As you're walking back, you notice the typically it would say uh, what is it, trail rated. Yeah, typically it says trail rated. We replaced that with our proven worldwide, and you notice it's blue now to go with the 4XE. Typically it's red. If you buy a 392, it's bronze. So just little things just to kind of keep it cohesive. Um, the AEV graphic across the hood, the windshield banner. These are little things, like I, you can almost call them Easter eggs, but you can only, you only get these little Easter eggs or whatever you want to call them if it's a true AEV built vehicle. Um, when it comes to resale value, people look for that stuff. Where's the windshield banner? Where's, where's the badge on the side? Where's your hood graphic? Where's your instrument cluster? Where's your headrest? So those little things kind of add up. It's kind of neat, right? As you're walking this way, I'll quickly show you. Um, on the headrest, you can see this one's got a painted hardtop interior. Typically, the interior of the hardtop is white, right? Mm -hmm. So painting it black, if you just describe it like that, it seems kind of lackluster. But seeing it in person, I mean, you don't want to spend 20 grand on the outside of your vehicle and hop in it. And for you, it just feels, it just looks like a normal vehicle. So it brings up the look a lot. But also, I don't care how clean you think your hands are. I take my freedom panels on and off all the time. And you touch that with white hard top and you get fingerprints all over. So that's one thing, cuts down on the dirt. But also glare, it's just darker in there, you get less glare. So that's probably one of my favorite things we offer, we offer actually. So we offer different seat options. This one's got factory, factory seats. But, right. uh, in the rear, same terminology as the front. Uh, frequency tune, triple rate springs, the remote reservoirs, again, specific to the rear, obviously. And around the back, again, you get just a little graphic to continue the AV badge along with the 4XE badge and then you've got this whole setup so so back here you've got the tire carrier and the rear bumper okay uh, <laughs> when you're talking about the tire carrier and the rear bumper it's important to note that they're, they're separate okay a lot, of, a lot of people think it's like one piece it's actually two separate pieces the tire carrier isn't even mounted to the bumper it passes through it and then mounts directly to the frame the reason we do that is because you got a lot of weight okay this is only a 35 inch tire but if it was a 37 that's like 120 pounds right we make a fuel caddy let's have one no i'll have to show you on mine we make a fuel caddy that mounts behind the tire yep like on that classic over there. Mm -hmm. You make a fuel caddy that mounts behind the tire that carries 10.2 gallons of gas. Gas weighs like seven pounds a gallon, just about, so there's another 70 pounds. So 120, 70, call it 200 pounds to be safe, right? That's 200 pounds when the thing is sitting still. As soon as you start bouncing off road, that number will multiply like that. So you end up with a 400 pound load that you're resting on a bumper with some bolts. It's not a very safe idea. So mounting it directly to the frame that's designed to support the weight is the way we decided to go. It's a bracket that mounts directly to the frame. Um, it's got a Zerk fitting on the back side so you can grease it. So if, if you need to, you can. The housing itself that the tire carrier is mounted to, the housing is rifled. What that means is it's a groove cut to the inside of the housing. The spirals kind of like the inside of a barrel of a gun. So when you're greasing it, the grease goes all the way up. It doesn't just pull at the bottom and start dripping out. It'll actually start seeping out of the top and you know you're good. Just whatever AutoZone special grease you can find. Maybe, maybe once a year around here. But then the tire carrier goes up, does like a 70 degree angle and flattens out, comes out right over here. Yep, so what that does is it allows you to use the factory handle to open the door. So a lot of, 
other tire carriers, you have to move the tire first. You have to pull a cotter pin, yep. swing the tire out of the way, and then you can open the door. Ha having the tire carrier mount down onto the frame and then attached to the tailgate here allows you to just use the factory latch. You notice though, this silver piece here is called a turnbuckle, okay? All that that does is keep the, the tire and the tailgate uh, perpendicular to each other. So the weight's not actually on the tailgate. You can undo this and they would just kind of flap independent of each other, but that allows you to just use the factory latch. So this is adjustable in case you decide to go up in tire sizes or if you change your wheels out or whatever, you can adjust the, the size here. Uh, but that way it operates as one thing so you can open and close it with the factory latch. All right? Uh, this, this tube right here, this main tube that supports the weight of the tire is called the main support tube. It's that same tube that goes down into the frame over there, okay? And then as you close the door, you notice there's this C-shaped piece here, it's called a saddle block. As you close it, it gets closer and closer and closer until you're right about there and it's touching. And that way when you close it, the last three inches, it pulls it in tight and keeps it from rattling. So when you're off-road bouncing around the rocks, it doesn't rattle. So you can hang on. So now that it's open, there's actually a secondary piece called a mast. This guy right here, the secondary tube. Mm -hmm. it comes over here and goes vertical. And there's a plate at the top. It's got three holes in it. So you mount whatever you'd like to there. Your sand flag, your CB radio antenna, your auxiliary lighting, whatever whatever you'd like up there. Just gives you options. A lot of people mount their backup light here just because it's up high out of the way. Kind of nice. Is there any wiring in place for that already? or? No, so that would be if you wanted to wire up whatever you can. We, we offer a backup light that you can mount here and we'll wire it into the auxiliary position, but this one just doesn't have it. Yeah, right. Your tubes are hollow, so it's like you have a wire chase built in. If you want to, yeah. Fish it through. So now that this is open, I can show you the bumper a little bit better. So the bumper, the whole, the whole point of the bumper, right, is to protect the rear end. Pretty self explanatory, but it, if it doesn't do its job, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So the corners are the most vulnerable area when you're off-roading. You, you, you're dropping off of a rock, you usually try to drop off at, a, at an angle, but consequently that's where the damage usually occurs. So, yeah, mandrel bent tube steel. So similar to our rams, yeah. It wraps around and goes to the frame over here, and it wraps around and goes back to the frame over here. So you have two frame attachment points, which kind of make it ideal for recovery. So you've got recovery points. Same weight rating as the front, a little over two times. Yep, yeah, a little over two times the weight of the vehicle. Wow. Just three quarter inch shackles, pull it out. But you notice the tube steel, we didn't go straight across, it would be down here. We bent it up so you gain a little bit more of your departure angle if you're dropping off the rock. So just little things, that's probably what, 30 degrees? But off-roading, that would make a difference between snagging and not. So little things matter. Um, splash guards just for compliance and to be nice for the guy behind you. Um, right above the tube, are these roto molded cross link polyethylene tanks? Okay, so essentially what these are is in the event one of these bends, these are perishable. They're designed to take the impact rather than doing any damage to your vehicle. This is 50 bucks, you pop it off, you buy a new one, and you save a couple grand in body work, right? So that's the idea. Same thing as the trucks though, nobody's bent one of these yet. I mean, I've, we've had people wreck their vehicles and total their vehicles and then take this off and put it on their next one. So we sell touch up paint, but the idea is if this bends, I've, I've been rear-ended myself and not and not bent this. So they're damn near indestructible, kind of crazy. But if you do scratch it, we sell touch-up paint, same color, pretty straightforward. All right, center section, you have your light for your license plates, your compliant little step pad, lighting back here, okay? You notice there's these little pop-outs. Those are for if it has rear park sensors. This one doesn't have it, oh, but... It's rear park sense compatible. There's different tanks, so you have a park sensor on the corners. Um, I've seen water things. Yeah, things. so I'm glad, so on the JKs, the previous gen Wranglers, we used to make these carry water. They were a little, I think they were 3.2 gallons a piece, if I'm not mistaken, but they used to carry water. The reason we don't do that anymore is because now there's park sensors, and water and electrical don't tend to like each other. So that uh, unfortunate thing, but that's why it went away. So. Um, back to the center section. We keep the factory hitch, okay? That is a big deal. The reason that, 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 that that's a big deal is your warranty for towing is based on that factory hitch. A lot of aftermarket bumpers, what they do is they throw this away and they cut a piece of square tubing right in there and they're like, okay, you're good to go. And if, even if your bike falls off, that's on you. 
your warranty for towing is completely based on maintaining that factory hitch. If you replace it with anything else, your warranty is up to whoever that manufacturer is for that receiver. So keeping that's a big deal. We just give it a little cutout so it fits correctly, but that's intentional. A little AUV cover just because we could. All right, questions about any of that? No. And spare tire, third brake light, and camera. Those are factory. We just relocate into our bracket so that it fits correctly. We're this side. Let's talk about this thing. <laughs> so, snorkel. And you're like, it's a it's a 4XE. What the heck does it need a snorkel for? The 4XE is not fully electric. It still has a little motor in there. It still needs to breathe air. This just gives it a higher place to breathe in that air. You're not breathing in dirty, dusty air down here because your factory air box is right here. That's right where your tire is kicking up dirty, dusty air, right? So you're driving down a dirt road. All this is dirty, dusty air, and this is trying to breathe in clean air. So just like construction equipment, you look at a caterpillar, it's not meant for bracing down the sand dunes, right? It, it's got to raise their intake just to get cleaner air into your engine. So that, that's all it's for. Cleaner air. Um, on a 4XE, that's really all it does because you're not meant to get these wet, right? But if you're looking at like a 3.6 Wrangler, um, it does improve your water fording capability because you can you can go in deeper water without sucking water in your engine. It also changes the sound of the engine because you're not breathing in warm air, you're getting cold air and you can hear it right outside your window. So if you have a 3.6 Wrangler or a diesel or a 3, or you don't, we don't make it for the 3.9 diesel. But if you have another Wrangler besides the 4XE, it sounds different and you get a little bit better gas mileage. This is strictly for dust, but really cool looking. It's riveted in, mounts to the A-pillar. Let me go here. And you got your build plaque. So the build plaque is right here. It has all the specifics for this Wrangler. So it's gonna say what year it is, what month it was made. It's gonna say what package it has. So it says JL350 4XE, which is this package, the 350, and it's on a 4XE. It has the last of the VIN. And then it has its build number. So this one is a 2023 model year, and it's number 020. So it's the 20th 2023 4XE we built, okay? So that's, when people say, what's your build number for resale value? What's your build number? This one's number 20. That's a big deal. So when it comes to resale value, that's that's the first thing anybody's gonna ask you is, what's your build number? Where's the logoed headrest? All that stuff I mentioned earlier. That's what signifies it as a true AEV built vehicle, not a clone, similar to like, like Roush or Celine, you know, you could jump online and buy a Celine headrest, but that doesn't mean it's a Celine Mustang. It's, it's things like this are what signify it as an actual AUV built vehicle and help a lot with your resale value. But what your customer does when they buy this thing, they take this and that card on the visor there, and it says aevregistry.com. So they jump on that website, they register themselves on, on the website as the owner with this information and some of their you know, what's your name, what's your email, yada, yada. And we send them out a care box. It's actually, it's called a welcome kit, but it's got a big bison on the front, which is, which is our logo. And it says, welcome to the herd. They get a AEV t-shirt, a AEV leather keychain, a passport holder, and a wallet, as well as uh, emails for like any new product we might've just launched that's relevant to them. Or if they live, like I live in Utah, and if we're going to Easter Deep Safari, we'll send them an email, hey, you wanna meet us there, uh, type of thing. So really cool in the community just to be connected with other G people that own AEVs. So 